um, my wife and I do quite a lot of traveling when we get the chance um, around the place, especially to Norfolk. And as we go around, we've been seeing uh, dragonflies and it's spurred my interest. So um, generally speaking, wherever you're walking, where there's water, whether it's a canal, there's a stream, uh, a river, a pond. This is um, Teddington Moor High Mere, if you're aware of it, I'd, a good place. Uh, even a small pond in your back garden. This is uh, a friend of mine who's made one out of a sink and she even gets dragonflies in there. So all these places you're liable to find dragonflies at the right time of year, dragonflies and damselflies. I suppose the most obvious thing is when they fly around you. Um, this is um, a southern hawker and um, these will actually come right up to you. It's quite, it can be quite frightening if you're not used to it. They come right up to you and, and look at you in the face. Uh, they're, they're the only ones that do. Um, and if you look in the vegetation around, you'll find uh, dragons and damsels perched. And dragonflies are a very old animal. They've been around for millions of years. Um, this one was, uh, this fossil was 150 million years old, it's been dated, and it was found in the same strata as the fine Archaeopteryx um, fossils. Um, this one's about 10 centimetres uh, in its wingspan, <coughs> excuse me, but the oldest, the, the Prodontata as they're called, uh, are three, over 300 million years old. Now these had a wingspan up to a metre across. So you can imagine what sort of mess that would make if you hit your windscreen as you're driving along. Uh, so what's the difference between dragonflies and damselflies? Well damselflies are small and dainty as you can see from the, the text that I've put on there. If you can read the text, uh, um, they don't fly as strongly as dragonflies. Dragonflies are large, robust, uh, powerful flyers, often stay um, Flying for long periods, some of them, some of them, you hardly ever see uh, perched, and they're quite difficult to photograph. In normal circumstances, the damsel flies their wings um, when they're at rest are held along the body, whereas dragonflies are held uh, out at ninety degrees. Although there is a, um, a damsel fly, which is an exception. There's always an exception to the rule, isn't there? And the eyes are, are different between the two. The eyes of damselflies are separated, whereas in dragonflies they, they join. Dra damselflies are also known as uh, devil's darning needles, whereas dragonflies are horse stingers. Well, both uh, are incapable of stinging. They, they are totally harmless to humans, although if you do handle a large dragonfly, it is possible that they will nip you uh, and draw blood. So uh, just... Um, Remember that if you ever get a, a dragonfly in your hands. You can see here the difference in size. The, um, the, the one on the left, the large red, is a fairly typical damselfly. The one on the right is the southern hawker, which is a large dragonfly. And we're looking at about 32 to, uh, to 36 millimetres long for the damselflies, where the dragonflies can be anything up to about 75 metres long. So it's quite a large difference in, in the size of them, and, and it's very obvious. The, to saying about the eyes, you can see that on the left there, the, um, the damselfly's eyes are completely separate, whereas on the right, the dragonfly's eyes do meet. They, uh, they meet in the middle at the top of the head there. The life cycle, it's um, <coughs> obviously the, the first thing we tend to see are these adults flying around, and then we, they, they will mate, and you, you get them in this, this wheel position. Uh, the female will oviposit. <coughs> the eggs, I haven't managed to get photographs of eggs yet. The eggs develop into the larva, which can stay in the water, uh, bearing on the species from three months to up to, well, more than five years, some species uh, longer than others. And then when the time is right, which is about now, the adults will start emerging onto vegetation at the side of, uh, of water, and the whole cycle will start again. So here we have a, a, a mating pair of dragonflies, a ruddy data in, 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 um, in this wheel formation. And the dragonfly here actually, uh, can you actually see my cursor as I'm moving it? Yeah, okay. The dragonflies 
grasp the male grasps the female at the back of the head with the claspers that are on the end of its uh, abdomen whereas the <coughs> the damselfly in the same wheel they tend to clasp if i go to the next one you can see at the top of the thorax but for the same reason holding the female in place and then the female if i go back a slide or two here we have the the male transferring sperm from his sec secondary sexual organ sorry the female tran transferring sperm from the male's secondary sexual organ here into the female okay that's the male that's the female and then she has this ovipositor at the end of the uh, of the abdomen there and in this particular species uh, this is an emerald damselfly she's got a, a blade like ovipositor which she cuts a slot in into the vegetation which in this case is a, a, a leaf of reed and deposits the eggs um, in there and you can see that um, sharp saw like um, ovipositor there which cuts into those leaves and they're quite strong because some species actually um, do this into the bark of a tree and here we have <coughs> a, uh, a pair of damselflies. Now all damselflies and the hawker dragonflies overposit in the same way with this uh, blade on the end of their uh, their abdomen. Okay. Now here we have a, a female southern hawker overpositing, and again, uh, there's that blade there that's slicing into the uh, into the vegetation to to uh, lay the eggs and here we have the male here is uh, holding on to the female guarding her because there's another male coming in now and if if another male comes in gets the chance uh, and the female's uh, willing he will actually remove the sperm from the previous male and replace it with his own and uh, usually in this case if, if the if the the pair are in a wheel for a long period it, it's because this is what's happening you don't want that one again come on there we go the hawkers uh data chasers skimmers sorry the hawkers and the damselflies they all have that blade that they use to um to slice into vegetation the darters chasers skimmers they dip their abdomens into the water and just lay the eggs straight into the water. Uh, they sink to the bottom. They have a, a sort of gel coating around the outside of them that protects them. Um, and this is a, a, a very poor photograph of a female broad body chaser um, depositing eggs in, in the water. I was intending this year to get some video of this, but it doesn't look as if I'm going to get the opportunity, does it, the way things are. Um, but one thing that uh, you need to take into account when you see dragonflies is just because you see an adult flying around doesn't mean to say they're actually breeding in that place. Uh, this uh, broad body chaser was actually in the, um, this is on a, a clothes prop in a friend's garden and they're a long way from any any sort of pond or, or sort of stream so it's obvious that, that that dragonfly is not breeding in their garden. So what you have to look for are, are larvae now the larvae vary in size and shape and they can be difficult to find you have to uh, use a net and um, go scraping this is an azure damselfly we have here an emerald damselfly larvae and a large red damselfly larvae the <coughs> data species look very different now in the previous ones we go back these caudal lamella, as they called, are uh, like gills. So they they uh, get their oxygen through these uh, through these lamellae. The the rest of the uh, the darters, the and the dragonflies, they have internal gills. So they draw water in through their their anus and then push it out again, and that they get the exchange of water. Very similar to to um, fish putting water through their gills, of course. The added benefit of what they can do there is 
if they're under if they're threatened they can use it like jet propulsion so they can shove this water out very very fast and, and push themselves out of trouble this is a hawker species uh, larva quite a bit larger <coughs> very different looking and here we have an emergent uh, damselfly so this is <coughs> The easiest way to find if the dragonflies or damselflies are breeding in an area, you look for emerging um, species. So they climb up the larvae, climb up the, uh, the vegetation, and then they start to force their way out of the exoskeleton of the larva. You can see here the eyes of this large red damselfly have already formed and it's pushing itself out and it gradually eases itself out. It's important that this uh, exoskeleton of the larva stays fastened to the vegetation. If it doesn't, I'll show you what happens later. But it's gradually working its way out. Now at this point, they are very, very vulnerable to predation. So they tend to be quite muted colours, not like the, uh, the bright colours of the adults. You can see those white filaments there. I'll say a bit more about those in a bit. And now it's fully out and it has to allow its, its um, body and its wings to harden. It pumps fluid into its wings because its wings are quite crumpled when it comes out. Pumps fluid into its wings, which um, take it their proper shape. <coughs> and then as they dry, it pulls the, the fluid back out of its wings again uh, while they, when they harden and then flies off. Now you can see here, we've got an emerald damselfly here that's just emerged. And you can see that it's almost the same colour as the vegetation it's on. So it is fairly ca well camouflaged against predation there. And this is a, this is a, a, a newly emerged or tenoral male. And here we have a southern hawker. Now it always amazes me when you look at the size of the, of the final insect compared to the size of the larval case that it came out of. It's absolutely incredible that, uh, that such a large animal can come out of such a small, small thing. And this is what we're left with, the exuvia. And um, this is the thing that I go around collecting uh, because it can't do any harm collecting. It's not like collecting flowers where there's nothing, uh, it won't reproduce again. But um, to, to definitely um, say for sure that uh, dragonflies are breeding in this particular area, I like to collect the, uh, the exuvia and from them I can determine what species is there. So this is, this is something that we, we do quite regularly. <coughs> and here we have, uh, um, can you see that on the right hand side? Uh, I've got all the, um, the people, uh, people's thumbnails over the top of this bit on the right hand side, but have you got the same? We've got a, um, I can see a dragonfly with half, with half, yeah. half the wings, and then um, there's a typical, Damselfly larva, and then a typical. Um, oh, that's fine. That's yeah. fine because uh, I've got the thumbnails over the top of it. I, I assume I can actually move that, can I? Oh, yes, I can, can't I? Oh, that's better. Right. You can so on the right hand side, ignore the, uh, the the topography of the typical adult dragonfly, but look at the <coughs> the two larvae on the on the, the right. You can see there are quite a bit of difference. The the left hand one is a typical damselfly. The right hand one is a a typical uh, dragonfly. <coughs> And uh, from these, we can uh, identify the um, what has come out of the water. So here we have common hawker exuvia, and <coughs> you can see the, the the whole of the exuvia here. Then we've got the what's called the mask. On the bottom left is the mask, which is the um, uh, the mouthpieces of the of the uh, the larva. <coughs> And on the right, we have the, the end of the abdomen with this, uh, these different uh, shapes. And if you compare that to the next one, which is the southern hawker, we have a totally different uh, shape mask and a very different epipropt here compared to, if we go back to the last one, you can see it has this, um, this shape to it with a point in the middle. If we go to the southern hawker, it doesn't have that. And if we go to the next one, you can see the masks here of the, the common <coughs> hawker on the left and the southern hawker on the right. And you can see the, the, the large difference between the two masks there, which is 
an immediate uh, identifying feature. And the, the darters have all the other um, dragonflies apart from the hawkers have this spoon shaped labium here uh, with these uh, um, teeth on the palps here, uh, which can be seen probably better in this one here. Yes, <clears throat> this is a white faced darter. Um, this has three dark lines on its ab abdomen, which is an immediate um, identifying features. But you can see here. On the bottom right of the screen, the uh, whoops, what's happened there? That's better. Um, the 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 labium here with the um, with the sort of teeth-like uh, serrations on them there, which they are fierce predators, and this mask can be shot out. It's like an elbow um, arm and an elbow, which can reach forward uh, about. Uh, two to three times its, its length there, and it can shoot that out, and it's got wicked pinches on the end as well, and they can grab their, um, grab their prey. Now, I mentioned these white filaments before. These are the <coughs> um, breathing tubes, the, the oxygen uh, system, which when the, uh, the adult emerges, they're pulled inside out. So these are what transports the oxygen around the body of the, uh, of the larvae. And when the adult leaves the exuvia, these are pulled inside out and left behind. And you can see here a broad body chaser, which is actually breathing. So it's breathing through its abdomen and it's pumping so, um, the abdomen. Let's see if we can get that again. Here we go. So you can see that pumping action, which is uh, pumping oxygen around its body. Let's go to the next one, please. We don't want that again. Now, <coughs> emergence is not always successful. We have here problems in that this adult has come out and it's the foot of one of the, um, of the leg of one of the, um, one of the legs of the exuvia has caught in its abdomen here and it's well and truly caught. I, I actually did try to, uh, release it and I couldn't. If, I, if I'd done any more I would have torn the, the abdomen off so I had to leave it. So that one will probably not get any further than that. This one has a crumpled wing here, caught, or rather the two wings are stuck together. Again I tried to separate it but I couldn't so that one's not going to fly. This one has not successfully inflated its wings here. You can see here it's a real mess so that one's uh, going to be uh, predated by something, it can't fly. And this one as well, it's got its two wings crumpled together here, you can see that in close up. And we watched that for a long time and it was beating and beating its wings trying to get them free but it couldn't do it, so that one's going to be eaten by something. Now here's a real sad story, this one, uh, the, the wings are still caught in the tail end of the exuvia. Obviously the, the exuvia is broken and the, the adult hasn't managed to come out of the exuvia case properly and the wings are still caught in there and they, they won't inflate. So that one's uh, not going to survive. And here's a, a common hawker. Now here again, what's happened is the, <coughs> the exuvia, the, the um, exoskeleton of, of the larva has come loose from the vegetation and it's not managed to pull itself out. So this was, this was exactly as I found it lying on some vegetation. So again, that's uh, an unsuccessful emergence. This chap, large red damselfly, found it one day like this. I went back the next day, it was still the same. It, uh, it couldn't, um, its body is like a Z shape and its wings are all crumpled. Uh, unsuccessful again. And they're also predated in other ways. This one's caught in a spider's web. And this one's just being got by the spider, injected with poison, and then it's gonna be sucked dry. Uh, I'm not sure, I've not yet found anybody can tell me that what this blob is on the end of the, uh, this spider's leg. I really don't know what that is. I, I must try and find somebody who, who can tell me what that is. <clears throat> this one was lying in the water and it wasn't until I looked at the picture I saw that there was a spider had got it. 
and uh, that's why it uh, obviously got it while it was just after emergence and uh, that's a sad tale as well and they're also predated by um, hobbies um, the hobby will catch them on the wing and eat them on the wing and I've watched that but themselves dragonflies and damselflies themselves are ferocious predators this one emerald damselfly caught a moth by the time I got the camera on it it had devoured the moth and within a few seconds all that was left was, was the scales still stuck to the um, to the animal's body this uh, large red damselfly caught a, an alder fly and actually flew from a um, uh, a nettle leaf onto this fence. Now that's quite a big fly, so it's they, they're quite surprisingly powerful flies if they can carry that that with them. Uh, this <coughs> I was watching a, a white leg damselfly it just emerged, and I thought, oh great! I set the camera up. I thought, oh, I can photograph this as it emerges and as it uh, inflates its wings, etc. Just as I was setting the camera up, along came this banded demoiselle and started eating it. <clears throat> so you can see it's chewing its wings. Now it's chewing on its thorax, moving up uh, towards its head, and then it's taken its head off. So that one, uh, <laughs> so a bit of uh, cannibalism there. And here's a, um, <clears throat> an emperor dragonfly with a damselfly in its, uh, in its mouth there, being caught on the wing. So what makes them such good predators on, on the wing? Well, we said about their eyes, um, the dragonfly's eyes here, made up of thousands of little facets, each one like a tiny camera on its own. So it makes them very sensitive to movement as, as the, the images pass from one facet to the next. So they must have a very complex nervous system that allows them to, um, to compute that and, and to uh, hone in on their prey. Uh, their wings too are amazing. They can hover, fly up, down, backwards, forwards. And <clears throat> I looked at the, having been to a dragonfly day with the British Dragonfly Society, we had a guy there who was uh, an aeronautical engineer and they were look, he was looking at the formation of, of dragonfly's wings through an electron microscope. Well, I don't have an electron microscope, but I thought I'd try it with my ordinary microscope. And I did a cross section of the wing. And the long um, bits sticking up on, on the wing measure the, the, um, the wind speed and the pre pressure over the wing. The ones underneath me the measure varying pressure between the, the humps and the, and the hollows. And this is what allows the dragonfly to actually know what its wings are doing and adjust them to, to, uh, to take it where it wants it to go. Very complex. <clears throat> They also have these combs on their legs, which when the legs are together, they're like um, baskets, so they can catch their prey in this basket formed from their legs, and then dip their head down and have a good chew. So let's have a look at some of the times going on. I think we better get on a bit. Crikey, doesn't time fly? Um, so we'll look at some of the species that we, that I've managed to photograph over the over the few years. I haven't sp there's about forty something species that breed in this uh, in the UK, and I've managed so far to get twenty eight. But the other the other twelve or so are not easy to to get. It means travelling to specific areas to photograph them. So it's a beautiful demoiselle, um, mostly in the south and west, in fast flowing waters and heathland streams. And the female, the banded demoiselle, this is fairly common, especially on canals, um, slow flowing streams and canals in lowlands. You'll see them along the uh, Cromford Canal, uh, almost any of the canals around here. Um, lovely, you can't miss them. Uh, the females, again, is rather like the uh, beautiful, but rather drabber. Uh, but the male, when it's, uh, when it's displaying, is absolutely superb. Just they flutter around and they, you just can't miss them. The emerald damselfly, this is the exception to the rule that's about the damselflies folding their wings along the body. This tends to uh, 
sit mostly with its wings at 45 degrees. This is a fairly common one. Um, you find them in lots of places. You find them um, Caddington, Moor, High Mere, find them there. Well worth going there if you want to look at dragonflies. Uh, here's an immature male, again, that colourless male, uh, colourless immature. The, fe the female, similar to the male, and you have to look at the end of the abdomen to really see the difference there. This is the willow emerald, very, very similar, but it has these goldy spots on the wings and a slightly different shape to the, uh, the anal appendages. Large red, one of the most common uh, of the damselflies, lovely, uh, lovely chap. Uh, the female is very similar. You see here the male at the top, the female underneath, and uh, doing the usual uh, overpositing there. In fact, sometimes the, the female will be totally submerged and, and it re relies on the male really to pull her out of the water again if they really have to go down deep to uh, overposit in vegetation, but they, they do totally submerged sometimes and I think we've got a water skater here coming in because they're a predator of, uh, of dragonflies if, or damselflies rather if they get the chance. Oh the white leg damselfly, you saw one being eaten earlier and this is the only other picture I've managed to get of one so far. The azure damselfly, very common damselfly again really blue. Um, this is the snooker player. Um, it's called. It's got this. What's called the coenegrin stripe on the on the side of the of the abdomen there, and it's supposed to be like um, a, a snooker cue with the elbow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I've never quite seen that myself. I'm, I've never managed to work it out. But then we've got a a glass here for a beer glass, and then down at the bottom here we've got a bow tie. So that's why it's called the the, the snooker player. So a good way of remembering because um, some of the several of the blue damselflies very similar. So um, remembering the snooker player is a good way of, uh, of uh, telling this one apart. Uh, I've got an immature male. You can see that uh, beer glass a bit better there. It's the female and the, uh, the mating pair again. <coughs> this is the variable damselfly. This is uh, similar again to the... Uh, it's the same species, uh, or the coenegrim uh, species, as the... Uh, Azure, it's got this stripe at the side, but here, if you look at these, um, the shoulder stripes, they tend to have these drops at the bottom. This one is continuous, but some of them have a gap between the, the stripe and this drop at the bottom. Then underneath, we've got a goblet for catching the, the drops. And at the bottom here, the, the shape is a bit like a bat. So this is uh, uh, the Dracula dra damselfly. So we've got drips of blood going to the goblet and the, and the bat at the bottom. So another way of, of uh, that's a way of remembering what that one's like. And here we have the, a pair of them. And that's a, that's an um, immature male. Now they're not too easy. The immature male uh, variable and the um, azure are difficult to, uh, to tell apart, except for the fact that we've got on the variable, we've got a bar between the, um, the eye spots on the back of the head, whereas the azure doesn't have those. The common blue damselfly, the common blue is very blue. That has a sort of tree-like shape on its, uh, on its first segment there of the abdomen. And we have an immature male there. And this is a blue female form. There are a couple of different forms of female, blue, common blue damselflies. And this is the green, green female form. So it's a bit, can be a bit uh, confusing. We've got an aged female here. And the, with a lot of the, the dragonflies and damselflies, as the female gets older, she tends to lose her typical female colouring, probably because she's had enough and she doesn't want more attention from the males. Blue tail damselfly, you can see the blue tail there quite clearly. And the, the, the wing spots here, are two-tone. And female, this is the um, um, typical female. Then we've got the female form in Fuscans or Infuscans, I'm not sure which, uh, which uh, way you pronounce that. And then we've got the uh, female form Rufescens, okay, which is better shown here. 
And then we've got the female form, Refescens obsoleta, which instead of a blue end to the tail, it, uh, it has um, a brown end. Am I running out of time? I think I've been going about 40 minutes, haven't yeah, I? You're going 32 minutes, you're all right, Richard. Oh, 32 minutes, yeah. is it? Okay, fine. Oh yeah, because mine started from the time I put the thing up on the screen, that's okay. All right, red-eyed damselfly, these tend to be in ponds with large um, floating vegetation, water lilies, difficult to get close to. Uh, so this is a heavily cropped image, but uh, this one was a caught one, which was held in the hand. You can see why it's called a red-eyed damselfly, can't you? And this is the small red-eyed damselfly. Now this likes um, mats of floating vegetation and algae in ponds. In fact, if you looked at the sort of area these uh, these enjoy, you'd think nothing, uh, nothing lives there at all. I think that uh, it was stagnant water. Uh, but they do seem to be able to tolerate brackish water. Common hawker. <coughs> now, um, this is widely distributed, distributed uh, common in upland northwest Britain in late summer. Breeds mainly in acidic standing water. So uh, you'll find them, for instance, at uh, Lightwood, uh, the old Lightwood Reservoir. Now, you can see here the common hawker has two stripes on the side of its uh, thorax. And I remember that because it's corporal, it's got corporal stripes, a so corporal for common, uh, common hawker. And you can see here, it also has some shoulder stripes, but they're not very large. Uh, the reason I'll point that out, I'll show in a minute. And here we have the female, and notice the very bright yellow leading edge, the costa on the wings there, bright yellow. Now we have the migrant hawker. This again has two stripes on the side of the thorax, but it has no or very small stripes on the top of the shoulders. As you can see here, just, just small dots on the top of the shoulders. So that's the difference between the, the common and the migrant hawker. And it's female, rather attractive. Sorry, immature male, I should say. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the female. Now the southern hawker, now this you can see the headlights, the large headlights on the top of the thorax and on the side of the body these huge splurges. So I remember splurge to be southern hawker. Very distinctive. Now the immature males, the immature male and the immature female are very very similar and you have to look at the um, the circled uh, anal appendages there to tell the difference between them. And you can see here the female. So we go back to the male and the immature male has very similar colouring to the female but it's got the, the third appendage in between the anal appendages there which the female doesn't have. And that's a female overpositing. Brown hawker. This is one of my uh, nemesis is really. Um, <laughs> I've tried and tried to get decent photographs of these. They, they fly a lot, they don't perch a lot, um, and when they do perch they tend to perch in, in amongst the vegetation. This guy was watching me and wouldn't let me photograph it uh, out in the open. Um, this is a female overpositing and if you remember earlier on when I showed that that female and the male together, uh, they were battering around the vegetation. You can see that uh, the females especially do get very damaged. The wings get damaged because they get a lot of attention from the male and a bit of a, a bit of fighting between the males with the female in the middle. Uh, this is the the best photograph I've managed to get of a brown hawk so far on a tree about uh, about three meters up a tree. One of my favourites here, we, we, we try to get to Norfolk quite a bit, and this is the Norfolk Hawker, the beautiful green eyes, and its uh, Latin name is Aishna isosceles, and you can see the isosceles triangle on the, on the back of the abdomen here, which, which gives it its, uh, its name there. And then the female um, overpositing. Our largest dragonfly, the emperor, uh, doesn't stay still very long again and uh, lucky to uh, 
very lucky to actually uh, manage to photograph it when it's uh, perching, managed to get a couple of shots. And this one is our longest dragonfly, the golden ringed. Now this uh, turned up, where was it? Um, in light, yeah, Lightwood, uh, Lightwood uh, in 2016. Uh, I saw somebody put it on Facebook, so I went down the next day and photographed it. Uh, that was the first. Uh, that was the first year it had been seen there. Now, the <coughs> golden ring dragonfly, the larvae of the golden ring dragonfly, have the longest uh, period that they spend in water. They can spend uh, as much as five years or more uh, in in water developing before they emerge um, as adults, and. They have an, um, an unusual way. They, they, they dab their, um, the females dab the end of their abdomen into, the, uh, into a stream bed um, to deposit the eggs. And they go along, it looks as if they're on a pogo stick. So as they're going along uh, depositing these eggs, it's another thing that I must try and get a video on. I've seen it, but not managed to get the camera out in time to, uh, to capture it. So uh, if, if lockdown is, uh, is ended, I might get up to Lightwood uh, sometime and. Uh, See if I can get some more pictures. It's a it's a lovely dragonfly, and this one. We've been on a couple of courses, and um, one of the tutors actually caught one, and uh, when he was handling it, it actually bit him and uh, and did draw blood. Uh, four spotted chaser. Um, this is the what's called the prenubular form, where the um, four spots are much larger than, than average. Male and female are very, very similar, and you have to look at the, um, no, I didn't put a ring on those. You have to look at the anal appendages. The males tend to curve outwards, whereas the females are more straight and go slightly inwards. That's really the only difference between the two. The uh, broad body chaser, this is a beautiful dragonfly. I've actually seen this and a female when the pond used to exist at the top of Grinlow Woods there, on the other side of the wall, on the uh, meadow there into um, um, Solomon's Temple, um, before it was allowed to get totally derelict. Um, unfortunately, the county council don't seem to have any interest in that at all, but I've seen them up there, so they must, I think they did, the male, the female was definitely overpositing anyway. And that's one of the things we could do um, within, in, Bucks and Country Park, isn't it? We could do with a pond somewhere, you know, somewhere around perhaps the uh, the visitor centre or something like. It doesn't need to be a big one. You could perhaps feed it from water off the uh, off the roof. It would be useful to have because I'm, I'm sure we would get some dra nice dragonflies there. Uh, I like the the backlit uh, shot this of this one of the broad body chaser. The the female is is lovely, bright yellow. Scarce chaser, um, photograph this in, uh, in Norfolk, this likes floodplains and washlands with lush vegetation. Those bright blue eyes are absolutely amazing. Uh, look at a bit closer. The black-tailed skimmer uh, with those green eyes, again got this in Norfolk, it likes lowland lakes, ponds and water in work sites with bare margins. It tend, does tend to perch on if, you, if you've got an old quarry or something like that uh, sand quarry then it likes the edges of the uh, the beaches more or less where it perches and a, a pair the bright these bright yellow areas on its wings are quite uh, striking the black-tailed skimmer female and this is an old one I found this. <laughs> I found this on the floor of uh, inside the visitor centre at Hickling Broad in Norfolk. Just, so I took it out and put it on the vegetation. Took some photographs of it. Very tatty old female. This is the keeled skimmer. Um, it's um, only one place in Norfolk where it's found. It's found in other some other areas around the country, but in Norfolk it's just one place. Now we, we visited there. I think on the our penultimate day in Norfolk. Uh, couple of years back and managed to uh, to find it which was really lucky because um, it likes this sort of boggy heathland area. It's called a keeled skimmer because the the line on the uh, down the, the top of its uh, abdomen looks a bit like a keel. White-faced starter, uh, one of the rare species, um, 
found in floating bogs. Um, Chartley moss, Wixall fen, and it's been reintroduced into Delamere Forest. Uh, an emergent male here, a female or an immature male. This is a, a male just starting to get to maturity. And you can see now in this one why it's called the white faced darter. Uh, a female. And this is the black darter. Now, I believe this has been found at um, Lightwood, right at the top. Um, so it's another one to go and look for sometime. It's a very small dragonfly, this. Uh, not much bigger than dam damselfly. You can see the, um, the female um, black data in the, in the foreground, whereas there's a, a damselfly in the background. So very small. Female. This posture here, the obelisk posture, it's written that um, this is supposed to be to reduce the amount of heat that they're getting from the sunshine. Well, I don't know, because to me, with the wings spread like that, it seems to me as if they get more sunshine than if they were in their normal position. And I can't, can't help wondering whether it's the females actually spreading um, um, pheromones to attract males. The common data, and notice the, the abdomen of the common data is fairly straight all the, all the way down, and the pair female, an old female. Um, now here you can see quite clearly the legs and the common dart has these yellow stripes down the legs which differentiate them from the next species which is the ruddy darter which have wholly black legs. Now the ruddy darter also has, that's the, that's the male ruddy darter, also had this, has this wasted abdomen that you can see quite clearly here but when you just catch a glimpse of them or they're moving around, you don't often see that. You don't always see that. But the, the, what the stripe on the leg of the, um, the common data is, uh, shows up. That's female. Having a pond uh, gives a lot of enjoyment to people who like to go pond dipping. And, and it's, it's great fun pond dipping, looking for not only dragonfly larvae, but other things as well. But just, for me, it's always dragonfly larvae that are interesting things. And uh, looking at looking at them, surprising what you can find. But it does um, help to identify the sort of species that are in that pond. But uh, this lady was absolutely thrilled when this damselfly landed on her um, on her finger. I mentioned the Field Studies Council courses. They run an excellent one at um, Preston Montford near Shrewsbury. This is Angela, uh, who was. Um, taught to handle dragonflies. Um, I was photographing and she was uh, handling them. It, it's not often necessary to handle them, but sometimes it's useful so you can photograph specific uh, things on a dragonfly. Uh, but there was identifying different dragonflies and uh, they do courses on exuvia identification as well. And this is Angelo with a, with a, um, a brown hawker. Field guides, well, there are quite a few field guides around. The two on the left here are fairly old ones now. They're, they're drawings, they're paintings that, um, of them, and they tend to be rather typicalized, stylized, whereas the two on the right are, um, especially the, um, the dragonfly one, that's photographs. And you can see then what the things actually look like. It's not like in a painting where they tend to be the sort of average. You can see the, the, in the photographs, they show you different aspects and you can, you can see much better what the dragonflies look like. And for the um, larvae and exuvia, the Steve Chan book there, it's, it's the only one uh, that's worth having. Okay, I've sort of rushed through the, uh, the different species there because time is running on. So. There we go. There's, uh, so there's lots more images on my website. If you, uh, if you want to know more about dragonflies, then join the British Dragonfly Society. There's lots of information on there. And I hope you've enjoyed it tonight.